رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك وعلى أهل بيتك المظلومين الغر الميامين صلى الله عليك يا مولا يا أبا الأئمة يا أول مظلوم غصبا لكم الفدا سادتي فاز والله من تمسك بكم وامنا من لجا ليتنا كنا معكم فنفوز والله فوزا عظيما. For the hastening of the reappearance of the Avenger, the Imam of the time, God's vicegerent on earth. Al-Hujjat ibn al-Hasan al-Askari recite a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. In order to have our sins and transgressions forgiven tonight and for our destinies to be determined in such a way that it serves our best interest for the rest of our lives, recite a second loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. In order to ensure that we remain steadfast on the path of Amir al Mu'mineen, hold on to the rope of Allah and follow in the footsteps of Ali ibn Abi Talib in this world until the day we meet our Lord and be raised with him in paradise, recite a louder salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Amir al-Mu'mineen, brothers and sisters, was the kind of person who never had a lack of admirers. The problem that Ali had and continues to have to this very day isn't that he doesn't have a sufficient number of admirers and lovers and those who respect him because Ali is like the most beautiful ocean 
Anyone who sets their eyes on any corner of the ocean will fall in love with it. Anyone who sees the waters, the blue waters of this ocean will inevitably and without a shred of doubt, if they have no disease in their heart, if they are able to see beauty as it truly is, will fall head over heels in love with this ocean. Which is why throughout history, believers and non-believers, Muslims and Christians, and atheists have fallen in love with Ali ibn Abi Talib. The love of Ali is one of those things that's not exclusive to you and I. Ibn Abi al-Hadid, whose name we've mentioned in the past, was a Sunni scholar, a historian, a collector of hadith, and he loved Ali ibn Abi Talib. He admired the great virtues of Ali. And this is evident in his book. So much so that other more extreme elements of his faith have accused him of being a Rafidi. They've said that Ibn Abi al-Hadid can't possibly be a Shia, can't possibly be a Sunni. Having praised Ali and even criticized his enemies such as Muawiyah. And so they've accused him of being a Shia, a closeted Rafidi. Ibn Abi al-Hadid admired Ali ibn Abi Talib. There's no question about it. Even though he attempts to make rationalizations and justifications for the enemies of Ali in his book over and over again. And even at the beginning of the book, in the very introduction, he says, Alhamdulillah alladhi qaddam al mafdul ala al fadil Praise be to Allah for putting the lesser ahead of the greater. Meaning that Allah put the companions who were lesser than Ali, who could not ever dream of reaching the status of Ali. But God, out of his wisdom, decided to put them ahead of Ali. Making Ali not the first Khalifa of Rasulullah as the Prophet intended, but the fourth. In other words, even he acknowledges that Ali was the greater, Ali was better, Ali was purer, Ali was more knowledgeable and more learned, and more just, and more brave. And add any adjective and Ali was number one. So Ibn Abi al-Hadid, Admired Ali ibn Abi Talib. Look at Christian authors, particularly those in Lebanon where there's a sizable Arab Christian community. People like Joseph al Hashim, who was a Christian and admired Ali ibn Abi Talib. You can see it in his poetry. People like George Jordak was a Christian and he admired Ali ibn Abi Talib despite not even subscribing to his religion. People like Sulaiman Kattani, who was also a Christian, yet he admired Ali ibn Abi Talib and said, who told you, in one of his poems, he says, who told you that one of the prerequisites of loving Ali is to be a Shia? He says, I'm a Christian. And yet, because I love Jesus, I recognize the qualities of Jesus exhibited in the likes of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says, let the heavens and the skies and the earth bear witness that this Christian is filled with the love of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And others and others, Abdul Fattah, Abdul Maqsud, Alfred Madelong, and Christian Orientalists and academics and scholars. Just yesterday, I was at a church in downtown Auckland and this elderly woman approached me. She said that in your speech you mentioned Imam Ali. And I recognize Imam Ali. I said, are you a Muslim? She said, no. She was an Australian slash Kiwi who introduced herself as a non-Muslim. 
And yet she said, I recognize Ali because when I was much younger, I read about him and every time I read about him, I break down in tears. What a great man this was. I remember once I shared one of the narrations of Amir al muminin with a Christian friend of mine. I said to him, we have a wise man who once said, Alfu sadiqin qaleel wa aduun wahidun kathir. Brothers and sisters, every single one of the quotes of Amir al muminin is enough to give rise to a civilization. Every single maxim uttered by the pure and blessed tongue of Ali ibn Abi Talib is enough to put an end to the miseries plaguing this world today. Just listen to this one hadith. One out of, do you know how many hadiths? How many maxims, how many attributions have been made to Amir al-Mu'mineen? My father recently published a book called Mu'jam Hikam al-Imam Ali. Mu'jam Hikam al-Imam Ali alayhi salam which is an encyclopedia of the maxims of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib. How many quotes do you think are mentioned there? Let me provide some context. In Nahj al-Balagha, there are roughly 300 quotes, 300 maxims, 300 words of wisdom at the end, the last chapter of Nahj al-Balagha. 300, which has made Nahj al-Balagha this incredible corpus that it is. So how many hadiths do you think my father managed to collect in his encyclopedia? 23,000 of them. Each one of them is enough to guide humanity to its salvation and away from its path of self-destruction. Wallahi al-Ali al-Azim. I stand to be challenged on this statement. So I shared with my Christian friend, I said, Amir al muminin says, that if you have a thousand friends, it's still too little. And if you even have one enemy, it's one too many. He said, who is this man? He said, that kind of wisdom, Aristotle would have to come and bow down before the feet of Ali. The greatest philosophers in history would have to prostrate before the wisdom of Ali. Who is this man that I've never heard of before? Buddha and others, Gandhi, would all have to come and study at the altar that is Ali. A thousand friends is too little. You can never have enough friends. But even a single enemy is one too many. Which is why if you do have an enemy out there, if you do have an individual who exhibits vitriol and deep-seated hatred toward you, try and neutralize them. Try and turn them around by showing kindness and compassion to them. Do exactly as the Ahlul Bayt used to do. I've said this before and I'll say it again, parenthetically. If you have an enemy, such as a neighbor, a co-worker, someone you come across, an Islamophobe, someone who's bigoted, someone who, for lack of understanding of Islam and Muslims, shows you enmity, neutralize them with love and compassion and respect. Go up to them with a cup of coffee and say, I got you something today. Share some present with them on your national day. When it's Christmas, maybe give them a, a card that expresses a noble emotion. Neutralize them. You'd be amazed how compassion and kindness and even a single word of love and respect could turn someone from an enemy into a friend. Or at the very least, if not a friend, someone who's neutral towards you. Someone who doesn't actively try to destroy you. And if that's what you must all do, what we should all do in order to neutralize our enemies, imagine to what lengths we must go in order to neutralize our friends. In order to take hatred and scorn and disdain away from the hearts of our brothers and sisters, our spouses, our relatives, our family members. Why is it that we see family members fighting and feuding and entering into a lifelong antagonistic relationship 
full of tension, full of hate, for no reason when we are all followers of the same great sage that is Ali ibn Abi Talib. Why, brothers and sisters? Isn't it a shame that two lovers of Ali, two admirers of Ali, would have to end up in a relationship that's marred with disrespect, with hate, with misunderstanding. Neutralize the enemy, turn them into a friend. My point is, non-Muslims have fallen in love with Ali. Muslims of all shades and stripes have fallen in love with Ali. Ali never had a problem of a lack of admirers. What was his problem? Listen carefully. His problem was a lack of true, loyal believers. Not just admirers. Everybody admires Ali. George Jordak, the Christian writer and author from Lebanon, who wrote multiple volumes in praise of Amir al-Mu'mineen and offering commentary about Nahj al-Balagha, he admired Ali. So much so that he says, I have read some of the sermons of Amir al-Mu'mineen and Nahj al-Balagha over 200 times. This should bring shame to all of us, shouldn't it? How many times have we read Nahj al-Balagha? How many times have we revised the words and the maxims of Amir al-Mu'mineen? It's kind of a shame, isn't it, that a Christian reads the sermon not once but 200 times. But the point I'm trying to make is this, brothers and sisters, is that Ali ibn Abi Talib never had a lack of admirers because everyone admires the truth, everyone admires the ocean, everyone admires beauty, everyone admires Ali, unless you have a sickness and a disease in your heart. Unless the individual happens to be a vile hypocrite, they have no choice but to love Ali. So what was his problem? That's what I want to talk about tonight on this incredibly, tremendously special and significant and momentous night. I've chosen this significant and momentous topic. Ali's problem was a lack of loyal supporters and believers. In other words, I already mentioned that Ibn Abi al-Hadid was an admirer of Ali, but he wasn't a true believer. He still saw Ali as one of the Khulafa. One of the companions, a great one, the best one in fact, but he was just one out of so many. To him, Ali's word was not a divine injunction. To him, Ali's commandments were not revelations from God and his messenger. And that's where we falter. We're all admirers of Ali ibn Abi Talib, and that's beautiful, that's wonderful. Perhaps more so than a lot of other Muslims, to whom the martyrdom of Amir al muminin is a footnote in their yearly calendars. At least to us, it's more than that. To us, it's a time of commemorating one of the greatest personalities in all of history. To us, this is about remembering the second most important person in all of humanity. Ali khayrul bashar, faman aba faqat kafar. The Prophet has famously said, Ali is the best man. Whoever refuses to acknowledge this, whoever doesn't want to accept this, has denied God himself. Has denied the sun in the middle of the sky. How could you deny something so obvious? as the sun or as the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the same fashion, a person like that would be expected to deny the virtues of Ali and the significance of Ali. So you and I, alhamdulillah, are miles ahead of everybody else. But are we there yet? Are we where Ali wants us to be? And يَرَاهُمُ الله حيث أمرهم, as Imam Al-Jawad famously says, are we the kind of people that God finds us where He is looking for us? Or are we elsewhere, occupied, busy with petty little things in this world? 
in this pile of garbage that this life, where are we? Are we where we're supposed to be? If we're not at the finishing line of this race before everybody else, at least are we trying? Are we running? Are we in the marathon? Or are we just spectators? Are we people on the sidelines? Cheering those who have gone and those who have surpassed us and those who are running in the race. Is that all we are? Or are we actually and actively trying to get there? Are we trying to be among the companions of Amir al-Mu'mineen or not? The hadith says that on the day of judgment a call is made. Aina hawariyu Ali ibn Abi Talib. Where are the companions, the disciples? Not just companions. A disciple is one who's always there with his leader. Who's always roaming around, walking in their footsteps, answering their call, at their beck and call. That's a disciple. Are you a disciple? Or are you just a spectator? An admirer? Someone who wouldn't mind having Ali's autograph. But other than that, that's as far as we're willing to go. In what camp do you stand? Are we, God forbid, people who follow Muawiyah in his footsteps and therefore end up in his camp? As opposed to the camp of Ali? You might say, well, that's a bit too much. That's a bit far-fetched. Me in the camp of Muawiyah opposing Amir al-Mu'mineen? Well, it's not you as a person. It's not me, it's our actions. If we measured our actions against those of Ali ibn Abi Talib, if Ali was at one end of the extreme, Muawiyah diametrically opposed at the very un other end of the extreme, if I measured my actions against these two, which of these two extremes would I be gravitating towards? Towards Ali or towards Muawiyah? Our gatherings, our weddings, our programs, our social interactions, are they closer to Ali's or to the other one? I'd hate to even mention his name. Listen to this hadith, brothers and sisters. Qala al-Imam alayhi salam The holy Imam says, As-siratu siratan You've all heard of the sirat. Sirat is what? Sirat is that bridge that connects the area where we are all going to be gathered in order to face our reckoning and our judgment. That area will then be connected by a bridge. Underneath the bridge, there's a very deep valley. In that valley is the fires of hell, the inferno. On the other side of the bridge is paradise. Everyone will have to cross that bridge. Now we have incredible descriptions of this sarat, this bridge. What it looks like how far it is, how people will cross over it, what kind of people with what kind of actions will have the chance to do so, and who won't be able to do so. A lot has been said about the Sarat, which I don't want to get into. Suffice it to say that there is a hadith that says, as Sarat, ahaddu min as It is sharper than the edge of a blade, a sword. That's the bridge. We're not talking about a wide highway where you can easily and comfortably walk right across to the other side and enter paradise. That's not how it works. It is sharper than a blade. And it is finer than a string of hair. And it is darker than the pitch black darkness of night. Imagine having to tread this rope, this thin, sharp sword at night, unable to see your way. Listen to this hadith. Qala alayhi salam, as-saratu saratan. There are two sarats, two bridges. Saratun fid dunya. One of these bridges is in this life, in this world. Wa huwa al-imam. This bridge is a euphemism. It's an example for the imam. If you obey that Imam, if you follow that Imam, if you measure your actions against those of that Imam, 
and you pass that test, then you're able to pass through the other sirat and the afterlife. It's simple. If you're able to maintain that fellowship with the Imam in this world, with Ali ibn Abi Talib while you're still alive, if you can do that, then Ali will take your hand on the day of judgment and he will allow you to enter through the pearly gates of paradise with his assistance. Ali Qasim al Jannati wa Nar. Ali yun hubbuhu Jannah Qasim al Nari wal Jannah. This is a Sunni scholar who mentioned this. He said, Ali's love is a protection from the fires of hell. Why? Because Ali is the one who decides to go to heaven and to hell. The hadith says, and this is narrated by Sunni scholars, that on the day of judgment, God will say to his messenger, Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. He will hand the keys to paradise to him. And he will say, Habibi, Ya Muhammad, these are the keys to heaven. You get to decide who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. So the Prophet then takes those keys and hands them over to his brother, to his sweetheart, to his, to his beloved successor, Ali ibn Abi Talib, and say, Ya Ali, you're the one who gets to choose. If our actions are aligned with the actions of Ali, we shouldn't have anything to worry about in the afterlife. Because the one who gets to decide who enters and who doesn't, we've already aligned our actions with him. We have nothing to worry about. Brothers and sisters, this is a tough test. This is not going to be easy. It requires education. It requires you actually learning what Ali ibn Abi Talib said and did. It requires you reading a few books about the life and merits and virtues of Amir al Mu'mineen. It requires putting in a little extra effort to figure out what Ali wants from us, what the expectations of Ali from us are. To actually read the final will and testament, the wasiya of Amir al Mu'mineen, instead of just being content with listening to a majlis and a member and then going back home as if nothing's happened, nothing's changed. It requires some work on our part. Ali ibn Abi Talib, as the Holy Prophet says, Ali al mizan. Ali is the scale by which everyone's actions are measured. Ali al mizan. It means Ali is the benchmark, the standard. He is the gauge and the thermostat. He is the gold standard of what is right and what is wrong. Allah says on the day of judgment, we will place the scales. Obviously, God isn't speaking about physical scales. It makes no sense. God needing to have physical scales and then taking our actions and putting them on the scales and see how much they weigh. It makes no sense whatsoever. The scale is Ali, which means our actions, your actions, my actions will be measured against those of Ali ibn Abi Talib. My prayer will be measured against that of Ali ibn Abi Talib. My conduct in public, my acts of worship, my helping of other people, my seeking the pleasure of God will be, be, will be measured against Ali ibn Abi Talib. Which means that we're in trouble, brothers and sisters. If Ali is the standard, we're in trouble. Do you know why? Because most, most of the time, what we tend to do is we measure ourselves against someone who's slightly lower ranking than us. Isn't that the case? We always look at the, the, the other guy, the next sister, right? If I constantly delay my prayers, for example. I'll always say, well, I'm better than the one who doesn't even pray. I'm better than the one who's lesser than me. Which is a terrible way to measure yourself. It's a terrible way to gauge yourself. See, we never do that when it comes to material possessions. You never look at your house and say, well, yes, it's just a one bedroom apartment, but hey, People back home, people back in Afghanistan and Iraq don't even have homes, they live in huts. So you know what, I'm happy with what I got. Most people don't do that. Most people compare themselves against the Joneses down the street. 
You compare yourself against your in-laws, against your friends, against your family, those who are better off than you, those who have a better car, a bigger home. Why is it that when it comes to our religiosity and our conviction and our devotion, we measure ourselves against those who are less than us just so we could feel a little bit better about the pathetic state of affairs that is my life. Ali ibn Abi Talib is the gold standard. Brothers and sisters, what is it that Ali suffered from the most? It was a lack of true believers. And it's what made the companions and disciples of Ali so great. Look at Salman. Salman al-Muhammadi. The hadith says that every time he was faced with two choices, he thought to himself, which of these two choices does my Imam prefer? And he always picked the choice that he deemed to be preferable to Ali ibn Abi Talib. فَكَانَ يُقَدِّمُ هَوَا عَلِيًّا عَلَى هَوَا نَفْسِهِ Why do you think Salman became Salman? Why do you think the hadith says about the verse in the Quran, وَآتَيْنَا لُقْمَانَ ال Hikmah in Surah Luqman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we gave Luqman wisdom. Imam al Sadiq says, Do you know what wisdom God gave Luqman? Ta'atu Imamih. Luqman recognized the single most important virtue, and that is obedience to the Imam of his time. <coughs> obedience to the Imam. And so God says, Wa'atayna Luqman al Hikmah. Because if you obey, a person who's perfect, then you will also be what? Say it with me. Perfect. If your actions don't deviate from those chosen by God to be His vicegerents and representatives, the shadows of Allah, the names of God Himself, the signs of God, Ali ibn Abi Talib, the ziyara refers to him as وَآيَتُهُ الْعُظْمَى Ali was the greatest of God's signs. If you align your actions with his, your actions will be perfect. The closer you are to his actions and his example, the closer you are to perfection. That's how it works. And the farther away you walk, the farther you are from perfection. And the closer you are to what? To that which Allah does not want to being driven out and cast out from the kingdom of God. That is what made Salman Salman. Let me share a couple more examples with you, insha'Allah. The other example is Al-Miqdad. Al-Miqdad ibn al-Aswad al-Kindi. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam says that the single most pious and greatest companion of Ali ibn Abi Talib at that moment after the death of the Prophet of Islam was Miqdad. Why? The Imam explains. He says, when they were dragging Amir al Mu'mineen out of his house after the ambush, after they set the house on fire, after they crushed his beloved wife, his young mother of his children, Fatima al Zahra, between the wall and the door, when they dragged Amir al Mu'mineen out, Miqdad was standing, his hand on the grip of his sword, his eyes into the eyes of Amir al Mu'mineen, waiting for the Imam to give him the signal. In other words, loyalty, obedience. Whatever you tell me to do, I will. If Amir al Mu'mineen wants him to fight, he will fight to the last drop of blood. And if Amir al Mu'mineen wants him to be patient, he will be patient no matter what happens. It is said, I haven't seen this hadith myself, but I've heard it from some scholars who say that one day Amir al Mu'mineen said to Miqdad, he said to him, Ya Miqdad, if I ever asked you to kill my sons Hassan and Hussein, as soon as the Imam said that, Miqdad's sword was already drawn. The Imam said, Calm down. I'm just testing you, I'm just asking. What made Miqdad this incredible force of nature, the one who was by the side of Ali ibn Abi Talib in those difficult times, was his obedience to the Imam, his loyalty to the Imam. 
Was it Abu Basir who came to Imam Sadiq or one of the other companions? He said to the Imam, by God, you see this apple in my hand? If I split it in half and you tell me that one half is halal and the other half is haram, I will say, I submit to whatever you say. How could one half of an apple be halal and the other half be haram? How could music be haram? How could this be haram? How could that be haram? How could this? All of a sudden, all these questions that people come up with. How? Because God said so. Through his vicegerents, through the prophet, through the imams. Mansur al-Dawaniqi once says to Imam al-Sadiq Listen, listen brothers and sisters. This is really important. As much as loving Amir al-Mu'mineen and knowing about his virtues is important, this is more important. Mansur al-Dawaniqi once said to Imam al-Sadiq, he said that if you're in the state of Ihram, those of you who have been to Hajj and Umrah, know what I'm talking about. And those who have not been to Hajj, we ask Allah in the name of Ali ibn Abi Talib and in the sanctity of this night, that he writes us among the pilgrims to his sacred house and among the visitors of the shrine of Rasulullah and Fatima to Zahra and the Imams of Baqi. Oh. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Ala Muhammad. He said to him, why is it that you claim if you're in the state of Ihram, as long as you're outside Mecca, you're not allowed to, for, for men, for me, women, the rules are different, but for men, you're not allowed to carry an umbrella or be under a shade while moving, while walking, if you're outside Mecca. As soon as you step inside Mecca, suddenly you can carry an umbrella and you can go around with a shade over your head. What's the difference? What difference does it make? The Imam said to him, the difference is, this is what God and the Prophet said so. That's the difference. What are you looking for? A, a logical explanation? Some rational justification? Some scientific facts and figures to prove that this is different from that? The greatest, most important scientific fact is that God and the Prophet and the Imam said so. End of discussion. End of discussion. If you have to be convinced of every single thing, then Islam shouldn't be called Islam, which means obedience and submission. It should be called Scientology. Because everything has to be proven scientifically. Not that Scientology is based on science. It's just a name they picked for this new religion that they made up. Islam is called Islam because you have to submit. And submission is where you're not fully convinced. You're not fully on board. You don't quite accept all the justifications, but you do it anyway. Because it's the right thing to do. Because you've been commanded to do. Just like a child. Imagine if you let the child choose whether or not they want to go to school in the morning. What's going to happen? Nobody's going to go to school. Why? Because the child, in their infinite wisdom, thinks, why is it that my parents are forcing me out of my own home and my cozy bed? Why can't I, can't I just stay home? and be with my mommy and be with my daddy. Why are they forcing me to do this? You hate me, you're trying to ruin my life. But it's the right thing to do and it has to happen. Because those who are wiser than you and I deemed that it had to happen. Next time you hear someone say this is haram or halal and it is, I'm not talking about Areas where people speculate and mashallah when it comes to religion, everyone's an expert. Everybody has an opinion. Everyone is willing to speculate and use conjecture. Oh, in my opinion, this, that and the other. And I've heard this so much. My point here is this. What made Miqdad great was one virtue, his obedience to his Imam. They came to Imam Sadiq They said to him, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, there's a man in Kufa. Every time we say to him, Qal al Baqir, Qal al Sadiq, every time we narrate a hadith, his first response is, Salamna. I submit. I submit to the hadith. Maybe I feel uncomfortable with what the hadith is trying to communicate, but I submit to it because it is the word of my Imam. The Imam said, May Allah bless him. Fatarahama alayhi. The Imam prayed for that man. 
may Amir al Mu'mineen pray for you and I, brothers and sisters, when we make a solemn commitment to obey the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt no matter what. Whether or not we're convinced, Sallamna, Sallamna, Sallamna. We submit, we obey. Let me mention a couple more examples of these great companions. You've all heard the name of Hatam al Ta'i. Hatam al Ta'i was not a believer. He was alive when the Holy Prophet was sent as a messenger. He refused to submit to him and to embrace his religion, which means he died a kafir, a disbeliever. And so the Prophet himself, when he heard of Hatam al Ta'i, he said to his daughter Sufana, he had a daughter named Sufana. The Prophet said to her, Law kana abu if your father was a believer, we would have sent our prayers and our mercy upon him. But he wasn't. So, he's out of the picture. We're not talking about him. But incredibly, his children and his grandchildren, you'll probably recognize one of them. You've all heard the name Hujr ibn Adi, right? Hujr ibn Adi was the grandson of Hatam al Ta'i. And he was a companion of who? Amir al Mu'mineen. He was the one murdered along with his nine children by Muawiyah and his mercenaries because they refused to disown Amir al Mu'mineen. Hujur ibn Adi is this great companion of Amir al Mu'mineen who was later buried in Marj Adra on the outskirts of Damascus. I've been to his grave, I have visited that sanctuary which was later detonated and destroyed by the vile creatures known as ISIS. That's the amount of hate they have towards Amir al-Mu'mineen. That even the grave of a 14th century old disciple of Ali is not immune from their vitriol. That's Hujr ibn Adi. But I want to introduce you to other members of this family. The first is Adi. Ibn Hatam al Ta'i. In other words, the father of Hajr ibn Adi. Have you heard about him? Adi ibn Hatam became a Muslim after being introduced to Islam by his sister Sufana. Sisters, may Allah bless you all. You can play a pivotal role in guiding your children, your husbands, your family members to Islam and helping them find the truth, helping them become more religious, more obedient, more submissive to Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. You do not understand, you underestimate your power to influence people. His sister Sufana introduced him to the Prophet in the 10th year of Hijrah. And so Adi becomes a Muslim and he became a loyal companion of Amir al-Mu'mineen. So much so, that after Amir al-Mu'mineen was killed, while he was in Mecca, Muawiyah encounters Adi. Listen to the story. Muawiyah comes and he meets with Adi ibn Hatam. He says to him, he says to him, how are your children? You see, Muawiyah was this cunning, conniving, filthy type of enemy who knows no boundaries, no red lines, no borders of any kind. He was the kind of person who was so manipulative. He always tried. Every single time he met one of the companions of Amir al-Mu'mineen, he would try to turn them against the Imam. For example, he would meet Ibn Abbas, who was the cousin of Amir al-Mu'mineen, and he would say, Marhaban bi Shaykh Bani Hashim. How is the master of Bani Hashim? Ibn Abbas would turn to him and say, Wallah, lastu bi Shaykh Bani Hashim. I am not the master of this tribe. The master of this tribe is Abu Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam, who was the Imam at the time. But Muawiyah had to try. That's how conniving he was. So when he met Adi, he said to him, By the way, how are your children? His children had died in the Battle of Safin. I mean, what kind of evil man would be the one who reminds a grieving father of the death of his children just to rub salt in that wound and add insult to injury? But that was Muawiyah, the son of Hind Akilat al Akbad. His mommy was the one who chewed on the liver of Hamza. What else do you expect? 
His father was Abu Sufyan. And until his dying day, he was confused whether he was the biological father of Muawiyah or not. So Muawiyah meets Adi ibn Hatim. He says to him, how are, how are your children? He said, you know my children died in battle, in the battle of Safin, fighting you and your filthy ilk. He said, oh really? مَا أَنصَفَكَ عَلِيٌّ حَيْثُ قُتِلَ أَبْنَاؤُكَ وَبَقِيَ أَبْنَاؤُهُ It seems Ali was unjust to you because your children were killed but his children survived. He said, لَا وَاللَّهِ بَلْ مَا أَنصَفْتُ عَلِيًّ No, no, no. By God, I am the one who was unjust to Ali for he was killed and I stayed alive. Muawiyah then said to him, You know, I still haven't avenge the blood of Uthman. The blood of Uthman remains unavenged. And I think only the murder of a noble person from Yemen like yourself can fully avenge the killing of Uthman. Adi ibn Hatam at this point, he stood up. He said to him, listen Muawiyah, Wallah, having my throat slit is easier for me than to hear you insult my master, Ali ibn Abi Talib. So if you wish, I, I still have the same intentions I did when I faced off with you in Safin. And I still have some strength left in me. So if you wish for me to pick up my sword, by God, I will right now. So Muawiyah said, no, 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 calm down, calm down. I'm only joking with you. How have you been? How, how are things with you? Unbelievable. Suddenly Muawiyah was afraid that Adi would actually find that same Alawi resolve that he had in battle. So that's Adi ibn Hatam. Now I want to tell you the story of the son of Adi. I mentioned one of them, Hajr. Hajr had a brother named at I want to tell you about at and one incident which sheds light on what it takes to be a Shia of Ali ibn Abi Talib, brothers and sisters. What does it take? One day Muawiyah writes to Amir al muminin threatening him and saying, I'm going to kill you. So the Imam wrote a response to Muawiyah. Listen carefully. The Imam wrote a response saying, Muawiyah, it seems you forget I was the one who killed your grandfather. I was the one who killed your uncle. I was the one who killed your brother in Badr. Do you remember that day? And I still have that same sword which Rasulullah gave me. And I'm more than happy to oblige. Then the Imam took that letter and called on at tarimah In other words, the grandson of Hatim at tarimah ibn Adi. Ibn Hatim. He gave it to him. He said, Tarimah, I would like you to deliver a little message for me. Take this and give it to Muawiyah. At-Tarimah immediately grabbed his camel. He set out from Kufa all the way to Sham. When he arrived in Sham, there was a group of people sitting outside of the city's main gate. At-Tarimah approached him. He said, Salam. They said, Salam. Then they said to him, Who are you? قَالَ جِئْتُ مِنْ عِنْدِ التَّقِيِّ النَّقِيِّ إِلَى الْمُنَافِقِ الشَّقِيِّ I have a message from the pure and pious one to the wicked hypocrite that is Muawiyah. Now remember, this is Muawiyah's turf. This is his territory. These are all his animals and his barking dogs. And so this tells you right off the bat who they're dealing with. They said, hang on a second. What are you talking about? Who are you? He said, I have a message to deliver to Muawiyah. He said, do you wait right here? They sent a word to Yazid. Yazid was the crown prince at the time. And Yazid sent after him. He said, bring this man. So they brought him to the court of Muawiyah. Let me try and paint a picture for you. Muawiyah is sitting on his throne, surrounded by his mercenaries, by his guards, by his aides, by his advisors, by his ministers. Right? This is the kingdom of Muawiyah. At-Tarimah stands right there at the entrance of the court. Muawiyah says to him, who are you? He said, I have a message from my master to you. He said, well, come on in and hand me the message, hand me the letter. He said, I would hate to step on this filthy carpet that you have. In other words, your carpet is one that was purchased with illicit money. I don't want to step over it. He said, well, okay. 
How about you hand it over to my advisor? Tarammah said to him, Khan al-Wazir, your advisors are all a bunch of treasonous liars who work for you, so I don't want to give it to him. Muawiyah said to him, so what are we going to do here? You don't want to come in and give me the letter. You don't want to hand it, hand it to my friend. Hand it to my slave. Taramah said to him, Oh, a slave that you purchased with illicit funds and who does your errands for you? No, I don't want to give it to your slave. He said, so solve this problem for me. How are you going to hand me the letter? He said, How about you get up and humiliate yourself and come and take the letter from my hand. Allahu Akbar. How is it that the followers of Amir al muminin are so brave? It is because they've aligned all of their actions with that of their master. They weren't born like this. They have this courage in their bravery because everything else they do is like Ali. So their bravery is like Ali. So Muawiyah gets off. Muawiyah was very, very obese, by the way. So obese that historians say his stomach would fall to one of either sides. He would physically have to, seriously, he would physically have to move his stomach into place. So he struggles, gets off of his throne, goes all the way, probably crawls, I don't know, goes all the way to the entrance and takes the letter from Tarammah. Then he said to Tarammah, why didn't you say salam to me? Why didn't you say salam to Amir al muminin meaning himself? He said, oh, I did say salam to him back in Kufa. That is my Amir al muminin not you. He said, well, do you need something from me? He said, yes, I do need something from you. Get off of that throne and give it to someone who deserves it more than you. Imagine someone walking right into the lion's den, risking his life with every single word that comes out of his mouth. Then Muawiyah said to him, fine, would you like me to give you a gift? Now Muawiyah switches gears. Here, he's trying to buy his conscience. He said, I would like to give you a gift. He said, sure, I'll take it. He said, hang on a second. Why would you take my gift but not step over my carpet? He said, because I would take your life if I could. You think I wouldn't take your gift? I'll take it. He said, all right, here's 100,000 dirhams, 100,000 silver coins. He said to him, give me more. He said, you want more? Fine, I'll give you 200,000. He gave him 200,000. He said, give me another 100,000 because my master, Amir al muminin is the true owner of this money. It's not you. Give, it, give me 300,000. So Muawiyah gave him 300,000. Then he said to him, wow, you seem to be the most knowledgeable and the bravest and the strongest of the army of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He said, Astaghfir Rabbak, bite your tongue, seek forgiveness from God. I am the best and brightest that Ali could send. I am the smallest soldier of Ali ibn Abi Talib. If only you could see his other companions, by God, you would drown in their ocean. Which is yet another sign of a true believer, a, a true Shia of Ali, humility. You never introduce yourself to an opponent by saying, I'm a scholar of Islam. That's the worst thing you can do. He said, if only you could see the other companions of Ali, you could, you, you would drown in their ocean. And so Muawiyah was left speechless. He just humiliated himself before this man, walked up to him instead of having him come, then gave him 300,000, then had this conversation, which again was even further humiliation. So he left him to go. By the way, he took the money to hand it over to Amir al muminin if that wasn't clear enough. So then Muawiyah looked at his friends. He said, by God, all of you put together wouldn't be one-tenth of this person. One disciple of Ali ibn Abi Talib could take all of us on and none of us could even respond to him. Brothers and sisters, there was one thing at the end where Muawiyah says to Turimah, he says to him, how, he asks him about Amir al muminin and asks him about Imam al-Hasan and Imam al-Hussein, and Turimah obviously has nothing but words of praise for them. Then he says to him, كَيْفَ تَرَكْتَ أَصْحَابَ عَلِي 
How did you leave the companions of Ali? Listen to his response. He says, Taraktuhum wallahi lahum lahu muti'een. I left them with all of them showing obedience to their master. If their master told them to do something, they would do it. If he told them to refrain from something, they would refrain from it. No questions asked, no ifs, no buts. And this, this is what it all boils down to. Submission, obedience, taking the Imam as your benchmark and no one else. What do you think made Malik al-Ashtar who Malik al-Ashtar was? Because at the end, Muawiyah says to Tarimah, he says to him, go and tell your master Ali that I will bring so many soldiers, they will look like bags of beans, bags of seeds. It's like, he gave a number in fact. He said it's like 40 bags with 10,000 seeds in them. That's how many soldiers I will bring to fight Ali ibn Abi Talib. At-Tarimah said to him, first of all, it looks like you don't understand mathematics. Because 40 bags, each one with 10,000 seeds, that's 400,000 people. And you and I both know that you don't have 400,000 soldiers to fight for you. So either you are an idiot or your writer is, is an idiot who put this number down for you. Secondly, let me tell you about a rooster that Ali ibn Abi Talib has. Because he used the parable and the euphemism of seeds. So he said to him, Inna li Aliyin deekan ashtara. Ali has a rooster and this rooster is going to come and pick each and every single one of those seeds and swallow them whole right into his stomach. He said, who are you talking about? He said, I'm talking about Malik al-Ashtar al-Nakha'i. Salamullahi alayhi. Salam. And who was Malik al-Ashtar? Amir al-Mu'mineen describes Malik. When they brought news of Malik's murder at the hands of Amr ibn al-As and Muawiyah, they killed Malik. They fed him poisoned milk and they had him murdered as he was going toward Egypt where Amir al-Mu'mineen had appointed him as his governor and his representative. When they brought news of Malik's death to the Imam, listen to this, the Imam said, he yelled a sigh of anguish and pain. And the Imam said, Malik wa ma Malik. Who was Malik? Do you know who he was? Law kana jabalan lakana finda. Wa law kana hajaran lakana salda. If Malik was a mountain, listen to this description. Sallallahu alayki ya amir al mu'mineen. Have you seen? Regular mountains, they have a slope, right? You climb them step by step until you get to the top, to the summit. But then again, there are these mountains that have a vertical slope to them. It doesn't have any angle or any way to actually climb it. It's a vertical rock, a solid structure that is very difficult, if not impossible, to climb up. He said, if Malik was a mountain, he would be the tallest and vertical mountain. And if he was a rock, he, would, he was salda. Sald reminds you of what word in the English language? Solid. Sald means as hard as they come. That was Malik to me. Then the Imam said, وَكَانَ لِي كَمَا كُنْتُ لِرَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وآله. Malik was to me how I was to the Holy Messenger of God. How was Ali to the Holy Messenger? You probably haven't seen camels, but she camels, when they give birth to a calf, to a small camel, what tends to happen, especially in the desert, is that the calf of the camel walks so closely and so aligned to its mother that it places its feet exactly on the footsteps of the mother. 
doesn't go left or right, doesn't deviate from the path. Because especially in the desert, one slight deviation and you could lose your way. One slight deviation to either direction and you could all fall off the cliff. So this is a, a parable in the Arabic language that a calf places its foot in its mother's footsteps. So when someone says, I follow someone like a calf to its mother, it means that I followed them to the letter. I do not deviate. Ali ibn Abi Talib was like that to Rasulullah. And Malik al-Ashtar was like that to me, Ali ibn Abi Talib says. In fact, I'll give you one example and wrap this up. It is a long night. It'll be an important night. It'll be a momentous night. But imagine, imagine a war like Safin, a war that lasted for four months, brothers and sisters. Battles back in those days would last one day. Jamal lasted one day. Badr lasted one day. Uhud lasted one day. Nahrawan and others lasted one day. Suddenly there was this battle between Amir al-Mu'mineen and his camp with the camp of Muawiyah that lasted four months. Four months, 110 days. You had 80,000 people on one camp. You had 120,000 people in the other camp. And there was a night called Laylatul Harir. In this night, the two armies collided. There was no light. There was no way of knowing what you're doing and who you're killing. And 200,000 people fought all night long. Laylatul Harir. So many people were killed in the battle of Safin that some started saying, لَقَدْ قُتِلَ نَسْلُ Arab. Arabs will become extinct after this night, after this battle. So you imagine this fight, this conflict, this, this campaign that lasted all this time with so many dead at the very last minute. Malikul Ashtar. See, this is what made Malik Malik. Malik al-Ashtar goes to a location that was so close to the camp of Muawiyah, to the tent of Muawiyah, that the way he describes it, he says, Shamratu Rumh. If I threw my spear, I would hit the heart of Muawiyah. That's how close he was. At that moment, and having fought so hard to get to that point, Amir al muminin sends a message to Malik al-Ashtar to come back. He sends the messenger back saying, tell Amir al muminin I'm only a stone throw away. I can end this battle. We can become the victors. We can win. It'll be the end of Muawiyah, the end of Yazid, the end of Bani Umayyah, the end of Bani Al-Abbas. The course of history would have changed forever. The Imam sent the messenger back. He said to him, your Imam says, come back. I know, I know. Malikul Ashtar dropped everything, turned around and went back to Amir al -Mumani. And that was the moment when they told the Imam that they have raised the spears with copies of the Quran or some pieces of paper, whatever it was that they had. I'm sure they didn't read the Quran there. They placed something that resembled the Quran on top of their spears saying, you know what? Let's make the Quran the judge and the arbiter between us. Amir al muminin knew that Malik could have ended the battle and changed the course of history. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to test people. God still has a lot of trials for people. And so Bani Umayyah have to come, Bani Al-Ambas have to come. Injustice has to prevail. Oppression has to exist so that God sifts through the good and the bad. Those who stand by the side of the truth, even when it's inconvenient and painful, and those who stand on the opposing camp. God's tests had to continue. The good had to come out of the bad. The bad had to come out of the good. But Malik was so incredible because of obedience. Brothers and sisters, are wrap up. I do apologize for taking so much of your time for burdening you with my speech. But it's important that when we discuss Amir al muminin we discuss how we measure up against Amir al muminin That we don't just call ourselves Shia arbitrarily. 
We don't just say we are followers of Ahlul Bayt when our actions, our speech, our clothing, our interactions, our gatherings, and everything else we do is all over the place. That tonight we make a solemn pledge and commitment and vow a pledge of allegiance to Amir al mumineen Tonight we give our bay'ah to Ali ibn Abi Talib and say, Ya Amir al mumineen you were the best example who had no regard whatsoever for the pleasures of this world. None at all. One day a man came to Amir al mumineen He said to him, Ya Ali, I need help. I need some money. So the Imam said to Qambar, give him a thousand. Qambar said, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, could you clarify, is that a thousand gold coins or a thousand silver coins? The Imam said, both to me are just a bunch of rocks. Makes no difference to me. Give him whatever is best for him. Allahu Akbar. Gold and silver are just rocks to Ali ibn Abi Talib. And so he lived a life of extreme asceticism, extreme austerity. But that life all came to this point in time when Ali ibn Abi Talib, when the holy month of Ramadan began, he would keep constantly asking his son Imam al Hassan and Imam al Hussein, how many days have passed from this holy month? Imam al Hassan would say 10 days. Then Imam al Hussein, the next day would say it's been 11 days, 12 days, 13 days. The Imam would keep asking because he knows what's coming. Because he's anticipating the day when he gets to meet Rasulullah once again. They once brought him what's called in Arabic faludaj. In Farsi we say faludeh. They brought him this drink which had perhaps a little saffron, some uh, pieces of uh, shredded apple, uh, maybe some rose water. It's just a simple drink. It's not the most extravagant drink. They offered it to the Imam. The Imam took one tiny sip and put it back down. They said to him, Ya Ali, atuharrimuha, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen. Is this haram? Is that why you didn't drink from it? He said, No, I don't say it's haram. But I'm afraid that if I drink this, Rasulullah never drank this. And I'm afraid I won't be able to meet my beloved Rasulullah. Tonight is a night when Amir al Mu'mineen is getting ready to meet the Holy Prophet of God. You've all heard in his maqtal that Amir al Mu'mineen, when he Noticed that his daughter Zainab was crying. Imam al Hassan and Hussein were crying. Abu al Fadl al Abbas was crying. The Imam calmed them down. He said, There's no reason to cry. Don't cry because here is Rasulullah telling me to hurry to him. Here is your uncle Hamza saying, We've been waiting for you, Ya Ali. Here is Ja'far al Tayyar who says to me that I am anticipating your return. Come hurry to us. And here is your mother Fatima, who is also waiting for me. All these years, Amir al Mu'mineen was waiting to meet his beloved sweetheart Fatima to Zahra again. 25 years later, after the death of Fatima, Ammar comes to Amir al Mu'mineen. He says to him, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, we've heard from you that it's recommended to dye your beard. You know when Rasulullah passed away, how many gray hairs did he have in his beard? Seven. And he died at the age of 63. When Amir al Mu'mineen died, he also passed at the age of 63. How many strands of gray hair do you think he had in his beard? There wasn't a single black hair in his beard. Allahu Akbar. He's the one who said to the people of Kufa, لَيْتَنِي لَمْ أَرَكُمْ وَلَمْ أَعْرِفْكُمْ I wish I never saw you. I wish I never knew you. سَئِمْتُكُمْ وَاللَّهُ لَقَدْ مَلَأْتُمْ قَلْبِي قَيْحَا By God, you have filled my heart with pus. How much you've hurt me. What you've done to me all this time. And so Ammar comes to the Imam. He says to him, Ya Amir al mumineen your beard is all gray. You've told us that it's recommended to dye your beard. Here's a little dye for you to use. The Imam said to him, Ya Ammar, ala ta'lam annana fi aza. Don't you know that I'm still mourning? Ya Amir al mumineen what are you mourning? What happened? Don't you know that I've been mourning Rasulullah and my wife Fatima's death? 
Have you ever seen someone whose wife dies, especially if it's a young wife? I've seen them. I've had friends whose young wives die. A young wife who dies destroys the house. The whole ceiling comes crashing down. You can't control a household, a family, especially when there are little orphans, if, the, if their mother is dead. Now imagine the mother isn't just dead. The mother didn't die because she got cancer. The mother died because she was beaten before the eyes of Amir al muminin in the middle of the street in broad daylight. Because they beat Fatima to Zahra with the sheaths of their swords, with their whips, while Ali ibn Abi Talib was watching all of this. That's what they did to Fatima. Imagine how devastated Ali was and how eager he was to finally meet Fatima on a night like this. Allahu Akbar. His family gathers around him. The children, the boys, the girls, they're all in grief. They're all crying. Amir al muminin looks at them one by one. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم كوفة is in mourning الله أكبر the orphans are all waiting outside each one with a bowl of milk We've heard that milk is good for someone who has been poisoned. The family has gathered around. Amir al Mu'mineen begins to console them one after the other. He says to Hassan and Hussein, Alaykuma bisabr, be patient. Fasatum tirawal fitanu alaykum kakata alayl al muslim. There will be fitna, there will be discord, there will be a big test. Imam al Hassan will be abandoned by everyone, including his friends. Imam al Hassan will be a stranger even inside his home. Imam al Hassan will be poisoned to death by his own wife. Isbira, as for you, my son, Ya Aba Abdullah, Fanta Shahid Hadhilum, you will be the martyr of this nation. Ayah, Ya Hussein, Hussein, Hussein. Ya Aba Abdullah, one day you will stand on the plains of Karbala and cry out, Allah hal min nasirin yansuruna li wajhillah. Allah hal min dhabbin yadubbu an harami rasulillah. And no one will answer your call when you speak to them. They will laugh, they will cheer, and they will clap their hands so that no one listens to your words. Allahu Akbar. Sixty years after Rasulullah, his beloved grandson Hussein is killed in Karbala in broad daylight. Ah, ya Aba Abdullah, not only will you be there. But your brothers and your children will all be killed. Your son Ali al Akbar will be killed. Your son Abdullah al Radhi will be slaughtered. Ah, ah, Ya Aba Abdullah. Not only that, but the women and the children. Zainab will be taken captive. Ruqayya, Sakina, and Rabab will all be orphaned. 
they will be paraded through Sham and Kuva. As for you, Ya Abel Fadl al Abbas, I have words for you. Amir al Mu'mineen said, This is in the hadith. He said to him, Ya Abel Fadl, Ya Kan Tashrab al Ma, Wa Akhu Kaatsha. Ya Abel Fadl. Don't drink any water as long as your brother is thirsty. <laughs> ya Abel Fad, one day you will hear the children's cries, Al Atash, Al Atash, Al Atash. <laughs> Then Amir al Mu'mineen, some have said, he grabbed the hand of Abbas and kissed it. <laughs> the same hands that Fatima will also kiss on the day of judgment. Allahu Akbar, Amir al Mu'mineen gives his last instructions. Then he raises his head, he looks at a corner of the room, and he says, Assalamu alaikum ya malaikata rabbi, ajarakum Allah ya mu'mineen. Peace be upon you, O angels, O messengers of my Lord. He then says, لِمِثْلِ هَذَا فَلْيَعْمَلِ الْعَامِلُونَ Let those who act, let those who put in an effort do so for this. Amir al Mu'minin sees paradise. But it's not paradise that Ali is looking for. He sees the face of Rasulullah, the face of Fatima, the face of his beloved family members. The Imam's forehead began to sweat. فَعَرَقَ جَبِينَ فَأَسْدَلَ يَدَهُ وَمَدَّدَ رِجْلَهُ وَفَاضَتْ رُوحُهُ الطَّاهِرَةُ Our Imam passed away. His soul was ascended to the heavens. Al-Hasanan began crying out loud, the voice of Zainab and Umm Kulthum was heard from outside the house. The orphans and the widows and the mu'mineen who had gathered around, they realized the tragedy that had befallen them. Ali has died. Amir al mu'mineen has been killed. Aywa wa Allahu Akbar. Al Hasanan. After mourning, they readied their father for his burial. They took Abu al-Hasan Amir al-Mu'mineen to where he is buried today. They took the body as he was about to lower the body into the grave. What a body that was. His shoulders bruised from all the food that he had taken to the orphans, to the strangers. His head struck twice on the head. One by, one by Ibn Muljam and the other by Amr ibn Wid. Imam al Hassan lowers the body into a grave that was prepared for him by Nuh the Prophet. He placed it inside. 
died. He then covered the body with soil. He then sat there along with Hussein and the other companions to cry. Now I say, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, Alhamdulillah, you were surrounded by your family and by your children. You were then buried with dignity. But where were you on the 11th day of Muharram when Imam Zayn al Abidin came? On the third day after the martyrdom of Imam al Hussein, on the 13th of Muharram, Imam Zayn al Abidin came to bury the body. Every part that he carried, that he lifted, another part would fall to the ground. So the Imam called out for a wooden mat. Allahu Akbar, why would you need a mat to bury Abu Abdullah? They brought the mat. Imam Zayn al Abidin then collected the various body parts of Abu Abdullah. But then he looked and the head of the Imam was missing. And the head was on a tall spear that Zainab looked at. Ya Hilal al Lady Zainab said to the head of Abu Abdullah when she saw it for the first time. She said, you used to look like the full moon. Why do you look like a crescent today? I don't want to tell you what they did to the head of Abu Abdullah. I don't want to say that they put the head inside an oven, that now the full moon looks like only a crescent. Then she said, Ya Abu Abdullah, my father told me that you would be killed. He told me that I would be taken captive. He told me that my brothers and my children would be murdered, but he never told me that I would see your head on a tall spear. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون We'll just recite Dua Al-Faraj, brothers and sisters, and then move on to Aza and the rest of the A'mal tonight. Dua Al-Faraj, Dua Al-Faraj, Imam Al-Zaman. Brothers and sisters, Imam Al-Zaman is the one who cries harder than any of us tonight. Imam Al-Zaman, give sadaqah on behalf of the Imam. Give sadaqah for the safety of Imam Al-Zaman. Pray for his safety tonight. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل دليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا اللهم وهب لنا رحمته ودعاءه وخيره ما ننال به سعة من رحمتك وفوزا عندك يا كريم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وصل اللهم على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله الطاهرين